It's really an honor for me to stand up here, uh, not only to be here in, in Australia at this conference, but uh, particularly to be introducing uh, David Bailey, who, uh, um, as most of you know, specializes in uh, comparative criminology and has been focusing his career on issues dealing with police innovation and crime prevention policies. Uh, his work has been a mainstay for all of us uh, in, in criminology and policing who have uh, um, had the pleasure of reading a lot of what he's written and sometimes uh, uh, been able to question him about some of his work and, and it's just been, it's a, it, he really has, has developed policing in the United States and around the world. Uh, his base is at the University at Albany in New York where uh, he's been most of his adult life. Um, I think we all know he's a scholar who understands not only the academic side but the real world of policing and has been able to integrate his ability to understand that and put it into practice in the academic world and has been a major contributor to what we know about policing not only in America but throughout the world. Uh, besides all of his contributions to criminology and criminal justice, it's a real honor for me to introduce him as a colleague and a friend. David? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, because I, um, this conference, in many ways, it kind of bookends my career. Because the first book I wrote many, many years ago was on public liberties in the new states. That was 1963. And now I am still doing the same thing. And the most recent book I published had to do with how you do democratic policing in war zones. Now, some of you out there may be thinking, my goodness, the poor man, he hasn't had a new thought in 50 years. Uh, that may well be true, as a matter of fact. Jeff, I'm very grateful to you for the introduction. I asked Jeff to keep it brief, because I've noticed that at moments like this, an audience consists of two groups. There are those who know me, but came anyhow. And there are those who don't know me, but have already scoped out the exit. So I guess the moral of the story is the proof of the pudding in moments like this is in the listening. All right, this is what I'm gonna to do today. Um, if I can manipulate this. There, I'm gonna take up these three topics. Have a look. All right, let me take up the very first topic of how far we've come, especially in the last 50 years, since 1963. Um, it goes back a little bit farther to the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. But my thesis is this, that there has been in the last 50 years an enormous change in human rights consciousness and practice in that period of time. And in many ways, it has been a true revolution in police culture. And I want to demonstrate that. I'm going to look first at the international dimension, what goes on at the international level, and then at what's going on at the state level where most enforcement of human rights in policing takes place. Um, the fact is, in terms of consciousness at the international level, it has been remarkable. The, or, or the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in, uh, in Switzerland says that before 1947 there were only two treaties dealing with human rights. There are now over 150, 150 in that short period of time. Um, the, uh, the, the Human Rights Declaration of 1948 is the most translated document in, in history, according to the Guinness Book of Records. Um, there are now 18 categories of persons who are covered by treaties having to do with human rights. Children, women, workers, the handicapped, elderly, aliens, immigrants, uh, lawyers, curiously enough, uh, journalists, gypsies, and so forth. 18 separate categories. There are 19 categories of violations that are now sanctioned under, under international treaties. Let me tick off some of those for you. Torture, discrimination, slavery, trafficking, hostage taking, procedures having to do with arrest, the death penalty, apartheid, weapons of mass destruction, and on and on it goes. In other words, there has been an enormous elaboration 
of what has been recognized to be covered under human rights uh, in the last 50 years. There is a scholar, Don Castle, who says this, the revolution of the second half of the 20th century has done most of the work of defining and codifying substantive reforms. That's a powerful statement. I think you happen to think it's, it's correct. I'll, I'll make another point as well. Some of you will remember from, uh, from uh, your uni days that Hugo Grotius is considered the father of international law, latter part of the 17th century. And I would argue that more has taken place with respect to the embodiment, the raising of the consciousness of the world community about human rights in the past 50 years than in the previous four centuries. It has been a remarkable time, and I simply think it's unappreciated for what has happened at the level of consciousness. Now let me move on, however, to the level of practice, what's going on at the international level. And once again here, I think there are beginnings, I think they are feeble, in terms of the consciousness, but nonetheless, in terms of the practice of human rights, the enforcement of human rights at the international level. Until about 1990, 1992, and the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, there were, at the international level, hardly any mechanisms for the enforcement of human rights at all. But I want you to look at what we have now got since that period of time, and that's only about 23, years old. We now have at the UN level, we have a, 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 a police force. Police force no, that numbers now at, at, in the UN uh, of about 13,000 people, uh, distributed at the most in 15 missions in, in the world. Um, there, are, there is now an international criminal court that I think you're all aware of, dating from about 1993, I think. Uh, and it's been ratified, I believe, accepted by over 120 nations, I think, at the, at, 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 at the latest uh, tally. <clears throat> there is also uh, a model international uh, criminal code that's been drafted by the International Peace Institute in New York, the University of Galway in Northern Ireland, and there was somebody else involved in that. Some of you in this room may know more about this than I do. But it exists, and UN police officers can carry it around in their vest pocket and enforce it. I mean, this solves, uh, it solves in theory a particular problem. When the UN police force or EU police forces or whoever it may be are working in a peacekeeping context, whose law do they enforce uh, against ordinary infractions? Do they enforce some kind of non-existing, previously, international law? or the law of the country into which they are objected, whose criminal code has already been, to a large extent, object, uh, rejected, or they wouldn't be there in the first place. And this is something that now they, are, they can carry around and use in the field. We also have, so there is, there is a, uh, 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 through the International Criminal Court, there is a mechanism for possible adjudication. Of, of fundamental categories of human rights. There is also the beginning of a detention facility, you know, the third element in a criminal justice system, in The Hague. People are incarcerated there and are kept pending trial. So what I'm suggesting to you is that in the last 23 years, we have begun to put together at the international level the kind of criminal justice enforcement mechanisms that we're familiar with at the state. Now, this is all embryonic. And if you think, as I do, that the provision of criminal justice and security is one of the defining characteristics of the state and of government, it is what government needs to deliver, we have at the international level the beginnings of this. Now, this terrifies a lot of people on the right in the United States who are afraid that the UN is going to take them over altogether, right? Uh, and, and, but in some ways, their paranoia is not ill-placed. Big things have been happening in the last 23 years. Now, all of these institutions have got to be strengthened uh, if we are going to have an international enforcement of human rights. But the beginnings are there, and I think they are not uh, given enough attention. Um, all right, so that's the international level of both consciousness and practice. Now, let me look at the country records. In other words, what does, uh, um, what's, what's the state record with respect to policing and the recognition of human rights. Um, I'm going to put up two, uh, a slide 
that shows what two groups have, have discovered in terms of the boundaries of, of this activity. This is done by Freedom House and for The Economist, who's gotten into the charting game in the last five years. Have a look. <clears throat> These figures are last year, uh, 2012. And what you'll notice is that, uh, and two things to notice. One is the economist is a bit more rigorous in the criteria that they apply than is Freedom House. The other thing to notice, and why I put this up here, is to some extent this shows the boundaries within which you could expect a police to observe human rights. And what this clearly shows is that some, in some countries it's just not on. It's not going to happen there. Others, there's a possibility. Uh, and how, how, how great that possibility is depends to some extent on the assessment you make uh, of, the, of the, the vigor of, of human rights and criminal justice and justice and so forth. I want to give you my own personal take on what I think is the status of human rights as observed by the police. And this is just, this is very personal. It's my own assessment. There are 192 countries at the moment in the United Nations. I would not be willing to be policed by, uh, in, I would not be willing to be policed by, I would not be willing to be policed by uh, the police in more than 18 countries, as I figure them out. Uh, in other words, in, as far as I'm concerned, in, uh, I'd say 100 and, what, that'd be 174 countries. Yes, 174 countries I consider absolutely unacceptable in terms of the kind of justice that I would receive from their police. Now the countries there I think I would accept um, uh, are the following. Uh, in the Americas, uh, there US, Canada, Costa Rica, I think, uh, possibly Chile, which is coming along, I think, in a substantial way. Europe is where most of these countries are. UK, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Netherlands, Belgium, France, Germany, Switzerland, and I have some doubts about Italy, Spain, and, and, and Greece, uh, but that's me. I'm giving you my personal take on the countries where I, I could accept it. I think Israel, Turkey's coming, not there yet. Uh, n uh, none in Africa, even South Africa. Good start, I'm having some, I think there's some backtracking there that gives me pause. No countries in South Asia, I think, have police forces that I can rely on to observe human rights. And I say that with great regret because there are some Indians here uh, and India is a vital democracy in every sense, but there are serious problems that we all know uh, about the observance of human rights at the station house level in India. It has a ways to go. East Asia, Japan, yes. Australia, New Zealand, maybe Singapore and Taiwan. Judgments have to be made. This is, this is my charmed list of those that where I would say, okay, I'm willing to accept um, what the police, how I'm to, I will be treated in these countries. And it means that in most countries of the world, the population is not well served and that there is a very long way to go indeed. Uh, I, I, I want to push this uh, a bit farther, this assessment of, of where human rights stand in, in world policing. Um, there, has been, there has been a growth since the end of the Cold War in international efforts to improve the quality of criminal justice around the world. It's a huge enterprise at the moment. I mean, and it's due to the fact that there is no, um, there is, is a, the world is not split between communist ideology and democratic ideology. The model of policing now is democratic policing. That's what it's called, whether you're talking about the OECD or the EU or the UN, that's the phrase. No longer kind of an authoritarian police as the model. And as a result of this, there is a huge international effort. OECD, EU, the United States, Canada, Australia have been engaged in sending people abroad to, to Im improve the quality of criminal justice and policing uh, for sure. 
Now, how, how successful have, has all that effort, and it's huge. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars that are being spent by AusAid and USAID and, and so forth uh, on this rebuilding reform effort. How successful has it been? Once again, I'm going to give you some impressions. Um, I asked, um, because it's very difficult to do any kind of scientifically rigorous study of this kind of thing, but I, a year ago, I asked 14 of my colleagues, English-speaking colleagues with one uh, French-speaking exception, and I asked them, these are people who do what I do, and if, I, and if Simon hadn't asked me to give this speech, any of the other 14 might have done even better. And I asked them the question, it's the question I am frequently asked, where, has international, where have international efforts at improving policing taken, and where are they meaningful? And I asked these 14 people, uh, one or two of them being in this room, as a matter of fact, and I asked them for their opinion. And this is what they said. Um, uh, they said that they could nominate only two countries unambiguously. They are Northern Ireland and El Salvador, unambiguously. And that they didn't think that the international efforts have been successful in any of the other places where we, people like you and me, have invested a lot of time and money and concern. That's, you may say, this is very cynical, uh, but I happen to, you know, that's kind of my view as well. The sad thing about this list, however, and I'm going to tell you, give you some quotes here in a minute from, from these uh, experts, is that Northern Ireland was done, as it were, homegrown. There was international in, in input into the patent report, which was done by, uh, with international uh, participation. But they did it essentially themselves, and that's a bit cautionary, because it really isn't the case of the international community and its efforts bringing it off, but, do, but as a result of a political process. Um, and uh, uh, to, to, to finish this, the people that I polled in this race had some comments about the success of our international efforts, and they are as follows. One person said, the picture, uh, the picture's pretty bleak, unfortunately. Another, only one country, unambiguously, can't think of a whole nation I would feel confident to nominate for having reformed its police in a humane, human rights observant direct direction under international auspices. Another, uh, some substantial and meaningful steps, but not sure that political commitment to support further reform exists. Improvements have been made only incrementally and modestly. Finally, in almost every country one thinks of, where progress has been made, for example, South Africa, there has al almost always been significant moves in the opposite direction. Now this is, you know, these are people I respect and I think you would respect too. And this is the, the gloomy conclusion that they've come to. So clearly we have some things to learn about this development, facilitation, export of human rights and policing around the world. All right, let me move to the second uh, uh, topic. What are the prospects for human rights in policing? I'm going to cite some work, some Aussie work, and then I'm going to give you a couple of suggestions of my own of where I think the future challenges are. Um, the work I'm going to cite is from, uh, it was been done by Tony Murney. Tony, are you here today? Well, he told me he was going to be here, but yeah, I guess he had the good sense to do something else. John is here, though, and John and Tony did this kind of work at the IDG, the International Deployment Group of, the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of Australian National Police uh, five or six years ago, right, John? And you published it in that chapter that we talked about today. And what they did was using international data sets uh, like Freedom House, World Bank, uh, human rights uh, uh, index of, of uh, quality of life and development and so forth. And what they did was to correlate for all the countries in the globe what the, what the kind of macro social, macro governance, macro social correlates are 
with the rule of law. And the rule of law is very close to what you and I are talking about in terms of human rights. And this, in brief, is what they discovered. They discovered that, in order, that the obstacles to human rights are listed there. Have a look. Or the other way to put it around, that you, human, you find human rights observed and rule of law observed where these things are favorable, you don't where they're not favorable. Have a look. What I think you carry away from this is that, uh, it, that improving, injecting, bringing human rights into policing is not just a matter of good guys and bad guys, but there is a gestalt here. There are larger social processes that have to accommodate the growth of the rule of law or the introduction of human rights. That, that you can't just tack on human rights in policing to bad regimes, corrupt regimes, places where the quality of life in terms of education, health care, and so forth is abysmal. We are engaged in nation building when we talk about trying to improve the quality of policing. Don't forget that. And I find in the United States, for example, that we're spending billions of dollars with, you know, and, and we go in there with great expectations, or at least great pretenses, uh, to what we're going to accomplish. And we do it in places which are simply not hospitable. And that doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't be there, but it certainly should caution us about the kind of success, despite the investment of vast amounts of money, that what you can expect to achieve as a result of that. So that's the first takeaway. The other takeaway that I want to just mention to you is that this, this is fundamental social uh, science research that Tony and John have done. It was done by a, uh, under the sponsorship of a police agency. Australians, uh, be proud of this. I think this is absolutely unique. I can't think of another major police service in the, in the world that has sponsored research as deep as this in terms of social science. I think the work is remarkable. I give you their names again. Tony Murney and John McFarlane. This is truly exceptional. And I think it has, you know, it, 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 it paints the larger constraints, the envelopes within which we have some hope to be useful in terms of expanding the scope of human rights and policing. Um, now, new challenges. I think there are two. I, you may think I'm a terrible cynic and very pessimistic. My heart is still in this, but I think it's uphill work. And I can't examine the last 20 years, let alone the last 50, without seeing that it is uphill work. And I think there are two major problems that are looming to threaten human rights. One is simply population pressure on resources. Uh, I think there is increased inequality in the world. There is certainly increased desperation in terms of the distribution of resources and what people have got. The frontier of that is water. And we're already seeing violence breaking out in terms of, of water and leading to violence. But the other aspect of this, and it's a part of, of the population pressure, is in, as a result of increased international migration. The international migration is increasing substantially. And with it, I'm afraid, is xenophobic violence in the receiving countries and violations of human rights uh, of those people who are coming into our countries. In other words, it's a real question. Do migrants have human rights? To what extent? You're worried about this. We're worried about this. The Indians are worried about it in the Northeast provinces. It's a worldwide problem. And I suggest to you that, 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 that this may be the frontier, as it were, of, of human rights backtracking in the next decades. So these are the two challenges, I think, resource inequality and the desperation of populations that are moving all over the world and looking for a better life. I'm not talking about the problem of amnesty. I'm talking about just looking for a better life for themselves and for their children. They are desperate, and we have questions to ask about how we treat those people and what kind of regimes of rights that they have. Okay, now the third thing that I want to look at today is what can be done to expand human rights in policing. There are really two choices here, uh, and the first is imposition 
that you, you just do it for people, or facilitation, where in a sense you come in in small ways and you encourage your local government to reform in ways that you want. Now, imposition, I'm just going to take a moment for this, because I think something very interesting has happened. There was a regime, an international regime, of imposition of good government, and that was under the League of Nations after World War I and up to World War II with the trusteeship system, which is now something largely forgotten. But the point of trusteeship was, under the League of Nations, that government is so bad in certain places, the international community has an obligation to take it over and do it better and to impose a, a government. Now, we all know what happened to the League of Nations. And in a post-colonial age, let me say, imposing kind of an international regime on some of the countries of the world that really need some help to save people who are being desperately abused, uh, asking that to happen in a post-colonial age is not really politically correct. At the very same time, in some ways, the UN now is doing exactly that, and it's doing it by stealth. That right now, under peacekeeping, the UN is engaged in nation building. It doesn't admit it, and it hasn't got the resources to do it as well as one might want. But I think very quietly, we are, as an international community, we are reinventing trusteeship. And as I say, this is ideologically kind of paradoxical at the moment, but I think it is beginning to happen, where we have come into certain countries, uh, and I think of, for example, I think of Timor, Haiti, Bosnia, and some places in Africa where the UN is now more, more heavily engaged, where we weren't just there to separate people who are fighting, but we stayed initially, at least, well, we stayed long enough and in some cases have come back to create good government, very similar to what the League of Nations did. Uh, we're not admitting we're doing it, but it's slowly beginning to happen. Where this goes, I, I, I can't predict, but it is certainly something to watch very carefully. All right, the second way of, of expanding human rights in world policing is through facilitation. That's what most of you in the room have been involved in, um, uh, whether it's for the aid agencies or whether it's for the EU or the OECD or so forth. You've been engaged in going abroad and trying to help various countries uh, do better. And what I'm going to do is to give you my lessons, what I think are the five, no, the, the nine uh, suggestions I have for accomplishing facilitation in the growth of human rights in policing better uh, than we've been doing so far. Here they are. I'll give you some moments to, to think about them. You don't need to scribble all these things down. You can have a copy of these. I'm sure Simon can make them available to you later. Let me elaborate on these very briefly. What are the implications of this? The first one I think is absolutely fundamental. Um, uh, the first step in reforming a police in the ways that we want is to get the existing government to agree or at least to close their eyes and let it happen, but not to derail it. You can't work around a government that doesn't want it to happen. It simply won't occur. And America is discovering this in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and it's a, a lesson that we've discovered elsewhere. But we continue to pretend that we can go in, and, and once again, I use the word stealth, by investing only in the police. We can kind of take the government over and push it in the right direction. It's just very naive. You are engaged in, in, in politics of a high order when you seek to do police reform. Second, you've got to help the governments uh, to develop explicit plans. And I think there are two things that you need to do. What I mean, and, and the model for this is the Patent Commission in Northern Ireland that came up with a very detailed blueprint of what had to happen to reform the old Royal Ulster Constabulary and then became uh, the, the police uh, service of Northern Ireland. Uh, there are two things that you've got to do. You've got to priori prioritize what you're gonna, where you're going to begin. You can't reform all aspects of the police simultaneously. 
And my suggestion here is you've got to pick out those aspects of policing that are most retrograde or are most resented by the host population because that's the way you get public support for your efforts. You just can't do too much. And you've got to have a sense of where we're going to go in steps. The implication here is it's going to take years, yes, and you're not going to do it all at once. But the second thing is, and, and again, it's a lesson that I think most of us know who have been in the field, to reform the police, you've got to reform other agencies of criminal justice as well. You've got to reform the bar. You've got to reform the court system. You've got to pay attention to corrections. Hmm? Because all of these systems and how they perform, or all these agencies, how they perform, conditions how the police are going to perform as well. So prioritize and broaden the ambit of reform is important. The third one is develop performance indicators. Um, Northern Ireland, which I keep coming back to, had an oversight process. Outside monitors who gave reports three times a year about whether the things that the Patent Commission called for actually happened. Somebody has got to be in place to keep score of what's happening with respect to your program. I'm a little tired, let me say about this, a little personal uh, grievance of mine or irritation of mine. I'm tired of the talk of metrics in measuring what we're doing because it suggests that all of this can be done quantitatively. It's very, very difficult to get quantitative measures for the success, for the institutionalization of human rights. You've got to do it in a more ethnographic, observational, subjective basis. I think most of the people in this room can go to a foreign country and by spending some time, you know how the police are behaving. Doesn't take long. And if you tie as my own country has done in the Department of Defense, try to come up with some statistics on all of this, you're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of money and employ a lot of academics and they won't be able to tell you what you're really doing. So I do, I, I do urge on everybody, don't, don't shy away from getting in the field and watching what's happened. Fourth, recognize that internal accountability is a precondition for external accountability. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you're going to keep score about what a local police force is doing with respect to human rights, you can't, you can't, you will never get enough information to do this if the local police themselves don't know what the hell they're doing. And if you go into most countries in the world, the police haven't got a clue about what they're doing. They don't know how many people are working for them. They're not quite sure what they do. They're not sure where they're deployed. And I'm talking about some well-developed countries, too, by the way, who suffer from these informational uh, deficits. And so what I'm suggesting is that one of the things that you have to do if you are going to successfully figure out whether your program of facilitation is working is that you've got to help the local police develop information systems so that they know what they're doing. Because you are ultimately dependent upon those systems or put it another way, you can set up all sorts of either domestic or international bodies to oversee the implementation of human rights and policing. But the local police can, can, can fake it, they can fool you, and you have got to find out how they collected their information and how good it is. If you don't do that, you don't have a clue about what's going on, and we continue to forget this. So I am suggesting to you, for example, you ought, we, ought to, we ought to be, uh, as part of our reform efforts, we ought to be saying to them, develop what Canada has in Stats Canada, for example, or the British do in the British Crime Survey, uh, or America does in the source book on criminal justice statistics, where we've got basic data that we can rely on about what's going on. Some of the, um, uh, of the and the, probably the best group that does this internationally is Amnesty, hmm? which won the Peace, Nobel Peace Prize in 1977, another indication of the, of the change of consciousness. Uh, so f helping the local police to, to, to increase their self-consciousness about what they're doing, I think is fundamental to achieving external accountability over what they're doing. Um, now, point five. Uh, just as we forget sometimes that you can't work around governments that don't want to do things, 
there are certain cultural conditions that you are going to have to work around. And you're going to have to decide we either try to reform those things or we don't. Let me give you some of the, what I think are the prime examples. Don't I have about four minutes? I'll do it. R relax, Jeff. You'll be all right. Um, for example, we have to take a look at the nature of the traditional justice system and accommodate our reforms to that. Uh, we have to look at whether public service, wh whether the police regard uh, policing as a public service or as a place to earn money and support their extended families. Uh, we've got to look at traditional authority systems, whether they're top-down or bottom-up. And if they are top-down, you've got a bigger problem. Uh, we have to look at the status of women uh, and how much you want police reform to respond to women who are in a benighted situation in almost every country on the globe. Do you want to attack that? How much? What parts of it? You better figure that out uh, before you, you know, launch on your program. I'm not saying you don't do these things, but you've got to make some conscious decisions. Uh, and finally, you have to look at whether uh, community loyalties are national or subnational. It's the root of conflict in many of these countries. Uh, in other words, I'm saying you have to assess what the cultural and historical impediments are and work around them. You're going to have to accommodate some of these as well. Okay. Um, um, point six, concentrate on changing institutional behavior rather than normative consciousness. The tendency of international programs is to get people in a room and educate them. Talk to them about the scope of human rights. It won't work. Their, their, their heads will go, you know, their eyes will roll up in their heads and they'll look out the window and can hardly wait for the lecture to be over. What I say you that you have to do is reform in human rights starts at the top, not at the bottom. It doesn't start with the recruits. You can preach to the recruits as long as you want, but if the organization does not accommodate what you're telling the recruits to do, it won't happen. And so the organization must change. It must change its incentives to allow the people who are doing the work to behave in the way you want. It starts at the top, not at the bottom. Seven, don't forget that human, that's public safety, safety is a human right. We often, and most police forces believe, that human rights and the achievement of public safety are antithetical. I happen to believe that's not the case. And I think there is a huge amount of research from your countries and mine that shows that in fact, advancing human rights can advance public safety. And, and that these are not trade-offs, but this is a hard sell that you've got to carry to the people you're reforming. Donor countries, point eight, donor countries must explicitly examine the trade-offs. Because many times, countries like yours and mine are in these countries not primarily to help the local population, but because they've got a concern with drugs, piracy, tr human traffic, uh, and now terrorism. That's really why they're there. And I get very tired, I must tell you, I get very tired of countries that are now doing what they think are good works abroad, and they attach human, human rights to their security agenda, more or less like lights on a Christmas tree. We pretend that we're there for human rights. We're not. We're there for some other hard-headed and important reasons. Uh, and finally, I come to, to what uh, we can do even when we, when we, we meet all of these uh, objectives, and that is to give voice. We must always preach the value of the reforms that we want. And more than that, we must set an example. We must set an example in our donor countries for what we're preaching abroad. We must walk the walk, and I don't think we do enough of that. Last slide. These are the, the, the points that I have made today. And so, let me give you my final watchwords on what good-hearted people like you and I are trying to do a war. And it is these, three of them. Be practical in your advising. Be credible in your practice. Be indefatigable in your commitment.